AV is communications, you know, well, especially communications, but the comms people like to foist this off on the tech people. The tech people like to foist this off on facilities. The facilities folks are like, whoa, you're too much. Go over to these, you know. So we really don't fit anywhere. Even even just breaking it down is, are you white collar or blue collar workers? Yeah, he doesn't even like get us, man. It's We're talking about you. Ah. On this episode of AV Week, what is AV? Who is AV? And should you be going to Infocom? All that and more coming up on AV Week. The network for the AV industry. What are you listening to? This. This is AV. This. This. This is AV Nation. Nation. This is AV Nation. This is episode 615, Who is AV? Hi, it's me, Brian, and this is AV Week, your weekly wrap-up of all the news in the audiovisual world. I am your host, Brian Heidrichen. Tim took the day off. We will work, uh, we'll see him. He's resting up, I think, for Infocom. There's a lot going on in the next couple of weeks. With us, though, we have Dawn Mead, all around AV Sage. Good afternoon, Dawn. Hi, Brian. Thanks for having me. And also Scott Norman, uh, Snap One Senior Director for the Commercial Market. Hello, Scott. Hey, Brian. Good to see you. So this is graduation season. So since you're a senior, does that mean you're graduating or? <laughs> Feels like it sometimes. But yeah, I've been around longer than I'd like to admit, especially in this industry. This has been a short week, which means it's been four Mondays for most people. I find that uh, ending a week early is much better than starting a week late. Uh, <laughs> On to our first topic. Uh, this week, Rave Publication had an article, uh, more of an opinion piece called AV is HR, uh, as opposed to we keep hearing AV is IT, is it HR, is AV just different? Um, so my first question for you guys is, how do you describe AV when you're talking to somebody and they're like, what do you do? Oh, I'm in AV. And then their eyes glass over. How do you kind of explain what AV is? Because I struggle with it personally. Yeah, it, it's certainly a little tricky. You never know kind of where to start. You're just like, take a deep breath and you're like, okay, where do I even start this conversation? Uh, a lot of times, it depends on who you're talking to. We, we've we talked to other people in the industry and we say AV and someone will say, oh, is, you mean antivirus? It's like, no, actually, uh, especially our IT, more IT MSP focused uh, partners that we have. Um, and then I'll talk to neighbors and always a great conversation start for that as well. Do you have a home theater? Do you have you know, a whole house music system. And boy, they love to talk about that. So I always start there and then kind of back into like, well, there's a whole professional industry around that. And, you know, you maybe have conference rooms that you're building and probably don't work right. Um, but ultimately, at the end of the day, like I'm part of that industry and I work for a manufacturer that supplies the products for that sector of the industry. And that really gets their wheels turning like, wow, you must have the best job on earth, you know, and it gets <laughs> really interesting from there. And it, it is a fun industry, um, but I think we've all have a different take. Yeah, I always say that uh, I get paid a whole lot of money to play with big kid toys all day and have fun. Um, but in short, yeah, it, it is hard to describe, but I like to tell people that we are the biggest multi-billion dollar industry that you've never heard of. And without us, modern society would not function. Because if it has a screen, if it has a microphone, if it has a speaker, in some way, it's AV. And we've been around for over 100 years. People don't know we exist. Um, I recently gave a talk at my company for some of the engineers that work in other parts of the company that uh, we're the invisible linchpin. You know, IT, yeah, you might be able to invent computers without it. But without, uh, without us, you couldn't have a screen to see what your computers were doing. You couldn't have speakers and microphones to get info in and out of those computers. It would just be a box with numbers that you couldn't really access. So really modern society is built around AV, even though they don't know we're a thing. So um, yeah, you, you know, you just get to point it out all around us and say, we touch everything in the modern world. We're hiding in plain sight. Exactly. And that, that's very similar to one of the best examples I've been given is, is if you can see it or you can hear it, we're involved in it. Right. And, and my other job is uh, I work with architects and interior designers and going in and talking to them about technology and how it interacts or, or works in their space or doesn't work in their space. I mean, sometimes I, I, I joke that my subtitle to my presentation I do is, is don't make us come in and ruin your your room or your space because they, they build these beautiful rooms and, and lobbies 
And then we come in and like, oh, we need to hang something right there. <laughs> like, what? You know, and also your acoustics are terrible. So we're going to put these soft things all around the ceilings. Uh, but it's it's a struggle, right? Because AV is so broad. And that was kind of the focus of the of the article was really AV is not IT, but it's HR because it is human interaction. It is, you know, it, it's all about getting people together or, or, or giving messages to people either in the workplace, you know, at the local mall, the amusement park. And, and it's, so it's really difficult to categorize it. And I don't think IT wants us. You, using that argument, though, AV is HR, AV is IT, AV is facilities. You know, we're a built environment in a lot of cases. AV is also, you know, um, uh, energy management. AV is communications, you know, well, especially communications. Marketing. But the comms people like to foist this off on the tech people. The tech people like to foist this off on facilities. The facilities folks are like, whoa, you're too much. Go over to these, you know. So we really don't fit anywhere. Even even just breaking it down is, are you white collar or blue collar workers? Yeah. Well, yes, we're baby blue collar because sometimes <laughs> we get to be there at six or seven in the morning with the guys with the hard hats and walk in a site while the walls are open. And sometimes we're just working nine to five or if you're working in a multinational, whatever time zone your customer is in. So it's very hard to define. But again, without us, modern society wouldn't exist. You could still have theater, but you'd be on a hill yelling at a natural amphitheater the way they used to in the ye old gold, good day, you know, ye olden days. Um, you know, you, you could still have sports, but there'd be like 15 people watching and again, standing on a hill so you could see what's going on. There, there would be no understanding of what's happening. Well, and one of the things uh, I, I like to tell people is that we're a lot like the window washer. When we do our job really well, nobody knows we were there, but it, when we're wrong, everybody sees the spots, right? Yeah, I think the, the, the industry in general just has this challenge around not having a core college curriculum that you become, you know, you graduate college with your AV degree. And, and then from there, it kind of continues to manifest itself. You're, you're not considered one of the core uh, trades out there with, that's working for the general contractor. They oftentimes, they don't put you into the projects, um, you know, the, the schedule and the facilities manager. It's always kind of like the side piece and but but i also think the industry is is shifting a lot especially over the last 10 years is that the contractors are tired of having to manage a fire drill with the av guys at the end of the project and they know like turning over for the customer like the av system being polished and really well done is is becoming a, a part of their interest on in delivering properly to their customers you know whoever is the project manager or the general contractor and so um i, I think that you know, the good ones especially are starting to make that a, a real integrated part of what they're doing. And, and that also comes from our side of the industry. We need to have certified project managers ourselves and uh, certified engineers and people with CTS certifications to, to show that professionalism. And that goes a long way. And, uh, you know, I think it's an important part of the industry. But Scott, you know, you mentioned that we don't have a lot of uh, higher education or degree programs, which is still true. There are starting to be some and there are a lot of related sort of like this with AV you know, kind of industries. Yeah, yeah. Um, but there isn't truly an AV industry. But I think in some ways that's to our benefit. Um, some longtime viewers of the show might remember my ex-husband slash ex-coworker. He's in the industry with his half semester of community college under his belt, but his 25 years of degrees and string of letters after his name. You know, he's making six figures working for the federal government and is considered an AV expert by most people you'd ask. And, you know, the same can be true. It's one of the last great opportunities, I think, in this country where you don't have to spend years in college or years in trade school to come into this industry and make a very good career for yourself because we'll teach you what you need to know. Just bring in some people skills and some excitement for what we're doing and we'll make it happen for you. And, you know, I, yeah, I ended up getting some master's degrees in semi-related topics, but my undergrad degrees are English and dance. You know, where's a girl with an English dance degree going to get a tech career that lasts 20 plus years and pays really well and you get to have fun. And once you're in the AV industry, we don't let you out. So that's the no. other side of the coin, too. <laughs> <laughs> We're like the mob that way. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, that's that's kind of like getting back to like 20 years ago, 20 plus years ago when I got into the industry, the job uh, ad in the paper, that's you know, back that long ago, you know, said, do you enjoy 
technology? Do you enjoy construction? Do you enjoy travel? Do you enjoy, you know, problem? And I was just like, yes, I enjoy all of that. And, 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 you know, that's that mix of blue collar. And then we come back the next day and now we're, we're white collar and we're sitting in front of computers and it, 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 we're doing an internship program. I got put in charge of that because I made too much noise last year about the program. And, and the whole concept is that we want them to experience all of the industry, right? So, and so when we're mapping this out, it's like, yeah, they need to get experience out in the field installing and servicing, but they also need to understand project management and programming and engineering and sales and then, you know, DevOps. And, you know, and it's like, there's so many facets to AV. Um, it, it makes it complicated for that simple explanation of, yeah, this is what we do. It's not computers. It's technology, but it's not computers. We're the cool kids in technology, which anyone that knows the stereotype of the AV guy in high school or elementary school, you know, that wasn't always the case nowadays. And we do cause, back to one of Scott's points, and this is something that I find talking with architects, is they don't understand what we do. And they also don't understand when we do it. And, and we're kind of that group that comes in. I always explain to people, we come in after furniture and before people. And anybody that's been involved in a large project knows that once furniture furniture shows up, people are sitting there. They're working in the spaces. And so that concept of, no, you need to build time into your schedules so that after the rooms are all cleaned and ready to be turned over, that's when we come in and do a lot of our work because we can't be there until it's clean and, and the network spun up. And so we, we need to be there side by side. Well, we, we need to do our finishing work side by side. We really should be in there with your architect and oh. your design engineer and your program phase yeah. and before there even is a building in some cases. We're there the whole time. Get used to seeing us. We're going to be around for a while. Again, AVs everywhere all the yeah. time. You just don't know it. One of the one of the struggles, I think, and technology is doing everything it can to solve that problem. But, you know, a lot of our technology, especially in the corporate world, um, education with um COVID really, I mean, they've always been into technology, but the, the, the concept of remote learning and having students anywhere and working on their schedule, I mean, even my kids, you know, public schools, everybody's on Chromebooks. And if you have a, if you have a snow day, well, here's some assignments for you to do while you're sitting at home. And it's like, oh, I, I, I didn't have that. So technology is leeching out there. But I, we're looking sometimes for technology to solve problems. And I think technology has gone a long way to making meetings better, right? Because we can have chat in the meeting while we're having a conversation. We can share files super easy. We can whiteboard and everybody can, can participate. Um, but the struggle still is, is I think a lot of people struggle with that meeting, right? And it's like, okay, we're here, but how do we remember to unmute how do we you know make it so it's a it's a good experience not just technologically but also a use of everybody's time is there a technology fix for that i don't know that there is but they keep looking to us and asking for one <laughs> I, I i don't think there is one um whenever i'm designing things i always say you know we can try to idiot proof things but as soon as you do they'll build a better idiot so <laughs> and no offense to any of our users out there, we don't really think you're idiots, but it's just human nature. We don't remember uh, how many times have I forgotten to hit mute or unmute? You know, uh, how many times have I forgotten to turn something on? And I'm, I work in the industry. Right. So, right. you know, it's I don't think you're going to come up with a, a complete technological fix, even with AI, because humans are so unpredictable. It's not going to happen. We'll, we'll find a way to confound the AI. I think as an industry, we've always struggled with the um, kind of onboarding of customers and the training of the customers on how to use our solutions. And, you know, you know, back not too long ago, we were building microphone systems and conference rooms with DSPs and home running everything. And we would use, you know, the, the video conference systems. And, and now we've moved to more of Microsoft Teams rooms and Zoom rooms and all that. Um, and, and the the hope is that oh these things are so well designed and engineered that it, it, people are just going to be able to walk in and use it um, without any training whatsoever and I think you know it really comes down to the finer details of um, you know I know actually in our company one of the things that we're struggling with is is a lot of new employees don't even know how to set up calendar invites um, how to send someone a calendar invite with the proper time selected with 
the proper notification put on it. Um, some people are struggling, a lot of people struggle with just marking their calendars as out of office. And when one person doesn't mark their calendar as out of office, then somebody sends a meeting invite and they're like, oh my goodness, I need to meet at this meeting, but I'm out of office. Um, and then that kind of continues to manifest itself into the usage of the conference rooms where people aren't using good etiquette with microphone muting, or they have their camera in a weird position with a bad backlight. And and so it, it seems kind of pilthy and and weird to have a conversation with some people about like, hey, here's how you manage your calendar properly. Here's how you should use best practices when you're using video conference. When you're at home, don't put it on your bed to where the screen's always shaking whenever you're talking. Um, you know, it, it's it's very basic stuff, but it would go a long way. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure if it where it, it's our part as the AV industry and the integrators to really kind of start to set those standards and encourage those companies and end users to like, hey, part of your HR, this is kind of back, back to AV as HR, like part of your HR onboarding process should be like, everybody's held accountable to managing their calendar properly and putting their PTO properly and sending a calendar invite when you're gonna be out of office and having a desk where your computer resides and the lighting is proper. And no one wants to own that conversation. Um, and it's tough for us on the AV side because that ultimately makes us look really bad when things like that. And, and people say, oh, the technology is horrible. Like I can't hear the person, but it comes down to all the small stuff that people get frustrated about and it adds up to a big frustrating experience. So I think we've got some, some work to kind of message that through the integrators, through the manufacturers, to the end users, and, and all get help in that area. And if you're someone like me that is an end user, but an AV person in an end user company, it's it's my responsibility. It's my job. It's my purpose to go to this enterprise of thousands of people that may or may not know the first thing about AV and say, hey, this is what you're doing wrong. Here are some ways you can improve. And to that point, when we had the COVID shutdown, I looked around, Avixa put out some fantastic videos starring the one and only Chuck Espinoza mm -hmm. on ways to set up for hybrid or, or home work, working from home. And it went from, you know, don't wear clanky jewelry, don't sit in front of a window, you know, make sure your network is strong, even if it means plugging in. And he just had, I think there were six videos in the series on just how to best present yourself when you're working from home or doing a video conference. And I, with permission, took those videos. I posted them on our company's learning site internally. I reached out to the folks in HR and in IT that were setting up the executives and the folks that for their working from home during the pandemic. And I said, hey, here are some resources from the AV team and from our industry. Everybody's gonna be using these resources to work remotely use these tips, watch these videos, encourage people. And that's all we can do is encourage them. We can't, you know, we can lead yeah. the horse to the water. We can't make them drink. We can't force them to watch the videos, but we can encourage them and make the resources available. And Avixa does a great job and, and several of the other organizations and manufacturers do a great job so, at providing education that we can share. Somebody needs to post those to TikTok. That's where they'll get watched. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But, but to your point, John, we found, uh, that internally we've started doing some of those basic videos of how to do a calendar, how to, you know, track multiple projects, because there's even the project managers kind of have that down, but even the engineers or, you know, where they're juggling a lot and, and we all use technologies all the time, but we, but we use it to do the things that we do. And, and as the right. generations we were talking beforehand about, um, I have two sons and, I don't know the last time they read an email that I sent them, mm -hmm. but I still put things on their calendars because I know that their phone is smart enough to go, well, they didn't accept it, but I'm still going to remind them that at noon they need to be here. And, 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 and that's something that the generation, you know, we always talk about the next generation, but even, even my generation, it's kind of like, you know, how many people aren't on camera or they're sitting there, but the camera is to the side of them because the, the you know, and, and it's kind of like, getting them to orientate the space and also have conversations with the architects on how to design those spaces. So that way, what's behind me when I'm in my cubicle having a conversation, it's not like a traffic to the break room or the lunchroom or, so, or it's not going to be distracting or there's something where I can put something there to let people focus on me and not what's going on behind me. Agreed. Awesome. So we are uh, quickly 
running into uh, Infocom. Uh, it's days away at this point. I think everybody has their flights packed, and they're, I hope <laughs> they're, they're getting the, the suitcases out. Um, and, you know, we just got done with NAB. And, and trade shows in general, there, there, there's, I know when I was new in industry uh, and when I was in broadcasting before this, I always wanted to get to NAB. I always wanted to get to NAB. Um, and, and, and because I assumed there was a lot to learn there. If nothing else, there was a lot to see. And so my question that I brought up in this article was, um, I, I don't remember, it was an article on avnation.tv. Uh, so go check it out. Um, the use case, you know, how, how valuable are um, trade shows? And I know last week they talked a little bit about it, about how Infocom is, and Avixa are really pushing to get more end users to show up. And I think 2022 had something like 27% um, end users, and they're really trying to push that out there. Um, and is this a, you know, are trade shows in general? You know, you've got Infocom, NAB, uh, CES, all, there's, a trade show probably every week for somebody. I'm going to Neocon for the first time, uh, which is all about like furniture, just because I'm curious to see what's out there uh, in, in corporate furniture. But do they have value? Or is it just a good time to go ahead, meet your friends and, and stay up late and walk a lot? It's part of our health fitness program. I, I think they do. I think for us, it's a really awesome time to schedule a whole bunch of meetings and pack in a bunch of meetings that you would have to you know, fly all over the country to have um, and get to see people face to face and have those those meaningful interactions. Also, you know, we have a booth at Infocom um, and it's a great opportunity for us to show off the latest and greatest and, and allow all the integrators in the space to come by our booth and, and see the solutions that we've been working on. So I think it has tremendous value. Um, and then I think also that people are moving to more of a little bit of a regional approach, um, doing the smaller shows, a little more intimate setting, take a little bit deeper dive on stuff because, you know, to cover the whole Infocom show floor in two days basically um, is, is a lot to ask and there's a lot of noise. So, um, but I think they, they both have tremendous value and, and we always look forward to them every year. Yeah, I agree. I, I don't think that trade shows are going away. Um, I just think you have to be strategic in how you use them. I had lunch two days ago with a manufacturer's rep that I'm just good friend. We, we just went out for lunch, the girls. And um, we were talking about shows and, you know, she said, oh, it's such a schlep going to Infocom and I just run, 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 run. And is there any value to it? But yes, there is. Uh, you know, now granted, I, I'm an end user now. I was an integrator for 20 some years. And when I go to the show, I love you guys in the big booths with the big trons and crons and whatever's in your name and who, you know, the big uh, projector and flat screen manufacturers. Love you guys. You're some of the greatest. You throw great parties, but I don't want to spend time in your booth. I'll walk by. I'll see your new shiny. I'll see your new sexy. I want to go see the little guy. I'm going to go see the five by five, 10 by 10 booths, see what's new and exciting. I might pop in and say, do you have anything really exciting and just completely new? Otherwise I'll see you at the experience center or I'll see you at my regional show with the rep or I'll see you when you come to my office because I work for a huge company now. You know, so it's it's more about going to see folks, to build relationships, to be seen, to experience what all there is to offer. And for new people, especially for new fo those, those new folks in the industry that don't know what AV is, go and sip from the fire hose, go to Infocom, get your mind blown, you know, just go uh, for three days. And then come back and say, okay, now I'm going to go to E4 or the Simcoe show or the whatever your rep show is here and see the detailed, oh, okay, that's how that hooks up. And that's the new, oh, I get it. That's very cool. You know, get that in-depth training or that in-depth look at, at things and talk about your specific use case that nobody has time to think about in three days in Orlando or Vegas. Um, and if you don't take advantage of the education while you're there, you're silly. Even if you don't have a CTS, CTSI, or CTSD that you desperately need our use for, you do still need to get some education under your belt, and there's nowhere else you can get it for free or real darn cheap than you can at shows like Infocom, the big ones. Um, it, you know, it's amazing. But at the end of the day, it's about the relationships, and it's just about the overall what is there, the scale of it, the scope of it, the seeing the new sexies, the, the shinies, and seeing someone that... You know, the guys on Aviation Nation are sick of hearing this story, but how many years ago I went to Infocom, I found this little 10 by 10 booth of a bunch of folks from Texas wearing boots and saying, hey, this is our one product that we have, but here's a bottle of hot sauce. 
And it was one product that solved a host of problems for our integrators. And our company bought the heck out of them. And today they're one of the bigger booths on the floor. And every time I see contemporary research, I'm like, hey, hot sauce guys. And they're like, hey, old school. You know, so you don't know when one of those five by five or 10 by 10s is going to become an industry stalwart. But if you don't check them out, you might miss a really cool product that will solve a lot of issues that you're having at that time. Yeah, I, I love uh, a couple of years ago, I, I, I've always gone as an integrator, um, but I went with a client. And so it was, you know, what does the client want to do? I'm not going to go on our schedule. I get to go do what they want to do. And we absolutely hit the, the, the perimeter of the show floor. And there are some crazy stuff out there. But then there's stuff that sits there and somebody comes like, we're looking for this thing that does this. And you're like, I saw that. And now I just got to, you know, go through my pictures and figure out where it was. And, but yeah, and, and it's a lot of fun to see some of the more cutting edge things, ideas out there that are maybe pushing that you may not see on a normal day. I, I call those, I call those my back pocket companies. I see them at the show and I think it's the coolest crap I've ever seen. I take note of the name of the company. I stick their business card in my back pocket and I just hang on to it. Might be five years, 10 years, 20 years till I find a project. And I'm like, wait, I know exactly who does that. And here's their info. And this is going to be awesome. I finally get to use them. So yeah, for sure. So I would say, so that we got the end user, the manufacturer, Scott, you enjoy it. I, I find value in it. It, it. it is a lot. It is the fire hose, right? So is there anybody we're missing that should also be joined that, that is in that gray area? Because we talk about how AV is, is so broad. Are there, are there, there are other groups that need to go in, you know, architects, interior designers, should they be coming by and say, and going, oh, that, that's a cool video wall, or that's a neat thing that I could put on my table on my next project. It would be fantastic to have them come to the show. I also think a big untapped market, which Infocom and Vixa reached out to a few years ago with some of their scholarships, students. You know, if you've got a high school kid and you're coming to the show as, as someone in the AV industry, bring your kid with you. Say, check this out, man. This is awesome. You can have a career here. By the way, NSCA and Invixa and 12 other groups are giving you scholarships for a degree while you're at it. You know, um, anybody, you know, we've had people in the past wandering off the street that <laughs> were the one year in, I think, Vegas, there was like a beauty and, and cosmetology show going on in one of the halls. And a couple of them wandered over into the Infocom hall and they were like, wow. So, you know, anybody just bring them in. All right. Great. Thank you very much, Don and Scott. Thank you for being on the show. I really enjoyed the conversation. If people want to see more of your work or follow you outside of your visits here on uh, AV Week, where would they go to find you, Dawn? Well, you can't find me uh, at my company because I can't tell you where I work, but you can always find me on all of the socials at AV Dawn. You can find me on AV Week and, and the AV Nation shows as much as they'll let me come on and blather. And if you are coming to Infocom, I don't get to be there for the whole show this year. However, if you will be there on Tuesday, make sure you come by 11 a.m. in room W304AB. I am co-teaching a class called Making It Yours, Developing Institutional Audiovisual Standards. So if you're an end user or somebody that works with end users and wants to develop their own internal standards, come see myself and the fabulous Michael Peterson of Iowa State University as we talk about how to develop standards and get integrators to use them. As an engineer, I love helping people develop their standards. It, it not only did it make them easier for them, it made it a lot easier for me. <laughs> Scott, where can people find you? Uh, so number one on our website, snap1.com. Uh, I've got a couple of cameos on there where you can find me in some videos. Uh, you can also obviously at Infocom, well, our booth is booth number 3634 at Infocom, 3634 at the Snap1 booth. We're kind of right in the middle in the main hallway, so you can't miss us. Uh, but we'd love to connect with all of you out there and uh, further the conversation. Thanks again, Scott and John, and thanks to you for joining us. Don't forget to head on over to avnation.tv and check out all the Infocom 2023 news, including how you can join us at the Tweet Up event at the Ice Bar Orlando and how you can get a chance to win $10,000 with, with your visit to Infocom. Head on over to avnation.tv for all that and more. And thank you for joining us. Remember to be nice to each other.